the name of this lecture. It's basically showing a variety of our projects and something we've been developing since, uh, since we won an, uh, the National Expo of Switzerland some years ago, which I'll show briefly. And we're titling this kind of strain of thought and this searching we have uh, in search of geographical reenchantment, which I will explain. Um, these are the four partners of Studio Vulcan. We are about 40 plus people, 45 people in Munich and Zurich, basically in Zurich. Uh, a very young office, it's the fusion between uh, two, two of the partners. And this is uh, our industrial hall where we like to play and do things. So a question that we're interested in, as you can hear, I'm American, I've been in Europe for a long time, but the Switzerland, where are we? What is this country? And it's uh, the problem that we deal with there is actually a global problem, but we are working mainly in Switzerland, so we talk about it, this transformation from the bucolic landscape that's developed organically to the increasingly sterilization and banalization of our landscape, so that it almost doesn't have a voice anymore. Um, and what we see, this is uh, a photo from Thomas Struth, the well-known German photographer who did a series of photos just outside of Zurich. And you can see what he's trying to say. Basically, everyone has a say in the face of the landscape, from speculators to farmers, traffic planners to um, politicians, everyone except one, and that's the landscape itself. So we've become more and more interested in how to give a voice back to this landscape and what that could mean. Um, it's a high call. We don't pretend to be better than others, but it's a, a something that fascinates us, particularly in Switzerland, because in this very tiny country with not much buildable land, you end up with a kind of vertical layering of things. Every, everything's being stuffed together. So you have, for example, this just outside of Zurich, a site we work on with a natural stream which has been put in the concrete. Then you have to get the pedestrians across it. You have to get the... the um, I'm used to having a beamer pointer. You have to get some... Um, Lighting, 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 uh, some, okay, so I can't, my English has gone to pot. Uh, you have train tracks and highways and everything stuffed in at once. You have natural preservation, it's all pushed in together. So we've become very interested in expressing this landscape in the sense of its contemporariness. I mean, a contemporary landscape with all of its contradictions, juxtapositions, paradoxes, and so on. And how can we not hide those things and try to say, Reenchantment means going backwards or being beautiful and pretty and so on, but how can it become an expression of these very strong landscapes? I've been following the discussion of this atmospheric uh, group. We all kind of know who they are, Palasma, Tsumtor and Co, or the Stephen Hall. For, since I'm quite young, I'm quite interested in phenomenology, perception, and, and these things. So a book came out a couple of years ago, and the editor, um, who was an academic, put together a series of articles from this famous group, and put this picture of Ajay and a, a plea to designers to put more atmosphere in their projects. And I thought, gee, thanks, it's a great tip, but um, my projects are sepia colored and they're also not historic Paris. They look more like this. And that's not a joke, this is really a project site. Uh, so what do we do? I mean, do we even have a chance? Is it just a nice title or do we even have a chance to put a kind of power into our, into our projects? Uh, we tripped across this book, uh, working on the Expo project. Um, it's a, Alistair Bonnet is a social geographer in, in England, and he writes in a very kind of nice way about geographies, and on one page at the very back, in some sentence, I tripped across, not this expression, but he said, can geographies have the potential to enchant us? And somehow that never got out of my mind. I couldn't stop asking myself this question because I'm very interested in the atmospheric discussion. Is there something like geographical re-enchantment and can we achieve that? And if so, how could that be? So uh, we developed our own kind of landscape theory uh, working on this expo project and it's been quite useful for us. We're actually using it quite a bit. We know the first two layers, these famous layers, the physical landscape, the natural landscape, it's the layer below everything, the, the raw, the uh, wilderness, the geomorphology, stone, wood, uh, water, these elements that are very powerful. We know that layer and we know that on top of that we build the cultural landscape which is the planned uh, urban, functional, rational landscape of production. And we decided to put a third layer on top of that, which we consider to be the imaginative layer, but the landscape, the mental layer, the intellectual, the emotional, uh, memory, experience, longing, etc. And we've been working with this, not in, in a, a really pedagogic way, we don't stand around saying, are we doing these layers, but what we do, what we noticed is that in our projects, we incorporate this quite strongly. Um, and it has been useful in articulating what we're doing. 
So I will begin with the um, competition we were able to win. It was an international competition for the airport park in Zurich. And the Natural Preservation Meets Shopping Mall. This is a kind of a good example of the Swiss paradox landscape of layering of all these uh, strange kind of artificial and natural layers which are on top of each other. And this is a site you can see. Um, it's an old glacier moraine. And that glacier, and you see the airport being built around the glacier moraine. And then the glacier moraine was cut off from its lar larger landscape by building a highway to the airport. And this excavation, which they took, they just plopped it kind of uh, helplessly on top of this glacier moraine. So you ended up with a very strange kind of natural artificial landscape. And then they thought, well, we should ecologically do something to compensate. So they planted woods, they planted um, fields, and they planted um, wetlands and they put it under natural preservation. This is not a rendering from us, it's an investor rendering, but you see now built around this landscape moraine, you see this huge building from Rinken Yamamoto, the Japanese architect, which is becoming like a small city in and of itself. It will open in 2020, and our park will open with it. So what's happening is you have an incredible densification on the periphery of the city, and this natural preserved area has to become a park, but we're not allowed to say park, and it actually has a lot of laws which we have to follow. So the question is, how can we work with this clash of landscapes? For example, here's the wetland with the parking garage after the airport and the advertising and everything kind of stuffed in there together. The site has some places that look just like historic landscape painting, but mostly it looks more or less like this. And so we took the ecological zones as the starting point for our design. And we started to play with them. We had very, very little uh, space to play with. And we started to say, how can we reform within the laws or even change the laws to be able to create something? And I'm just going to tell the very simple story, conceptual story, because I'm showing several projects. But there's a lot of small things happening on the site. But we decided to have two main gestures that can be understandable by all the international visitors of the airport. And the first one was to do something with nature at the scale, at the larger landscape scale. You can see the airport on the left, then this huge Yamamoto building, eight stories high. And so we made this 200 meter ring of trees, which describes the woodland around it and the uh, clearing in the middle, where we had to change some laws and make new categories for, for woodlands and all kinds of things to even be able to do this. And we worked at this large landscape scale of reading. And of course, when you're flying over the park, you're seeing the circle, which is the name of the big new building and the name of the uh, moraine and everything else. So. And the second thing which fascinated us is this kind of wedding cake of layers between natural, artificial, you know, excavation is like natural material stuck in artificial, then you have the uh, Swiss, so you have the Swiss archaic uh, glacier, then you have this Swiss woodland that's actually only 40 years old and quite ugly. Then you have this topography, which you could say is natural, but in fact it's excavation, so it's quite artificial. And then above all that, you have the sky. So we were quite interested in this moving from through these layers up and back down again, which is what the visitor does. And so we were asked actually to make a funicular so that handicapped people could get to the top. So we were moving up through this glacier material, through the woods, uh, where we put interventions in. We worked with uh, Anders, Nielsen Busse, Anders Busse Nielsen from uh, Denmark, who does the Waldlabor in trying to work with, with the woods as material, up through this strange abstract sculpture of topography and to the top to a kind of sky platform where this, uh, we have different things happening, this water plane and this steam make the sky physically uh, sense, sorry, my English is really bad, but. Uh, you can sense the emptiness of the sky through this gesture. And again, the investor version of that, um, of that expression of seeing planes and so on and so forth. We're also working with a, a whole series of small interventions, like a pavilion that actually works with the topography, our funicular. We have sky gazing chairs, which are based on the famous American chair of, um, in, yeah, um, sorry, New York. Okay, the next project is a School of the Arts in Zurich. It's an old yogurt factory, EM2N. The architects have done the new design for the School of Art. It's an absolutely enormous roof. It's like a whole landscape by itself. And we had, in addition to such issues, as you can see in the paving, working with water cycles and so on, we had the issue of how to make a garden. There were thousands of constraints, and it had to be built in no time at all. So the answer was to make a pre-produced um, project Oh, sorry, I just um, uh, forgot one thing. The project is about natural 
production and about decay. Also how nature, you produce nature and, uh, nature and decay at the same time. So basically the, the garden was produced in advance uh, for one year. And on the opening day, this produced instant rooftop was just plopped down. And the interesting thing about it is that the day the architects give in the key and make their opening party, their project's finished and our project is just starting to decay. And this is the whole project about uh, production of nature and production of decay, so, so to speak, in the contemporary landscape. All the plants are in wooden boxes. This is at the beginning. All the plants begin to grow. They grow. The boxes begin to fall apart. And you end up with this overgrown wilderness on the 10th floor. You have kind of wilderness on the 10th floor of a school. So you're playing, I mean, it's about this urban nature. What are we doing? Where are we? What kind of landscape am I in? And how does this work? The next project we've given the name Wildwood Plaza. Um, it's on a small woodland fragment, a small hill, also glacier moraine, at the edge of a small city outside of Zurich in the suburbs, basically. And the fascinating about the small woodland hill, and the, the client just said, could you do something to make the woods an experience? Okay, think about it. And what you see in these three small orange dots are three completely different woodland landscapes in the tiniest space in the world, just next to the bathroom window of these suburban houses. And that's in order to fascinate us and say, well, you know, we say we're going walking in the woods and usually we just kind of walk. There's a bunch of trees and you're walking and maybe you're chatting and you're walking in the woods. But it's such an incredibly undifferentiated thing for such a magical landscape. Because woodlands have something that almost no other landscape has uh, except water. And that is that it has no front, no back, no right, no left. It has no focal point. It's just there, pardon, surrounding us. And this psychological state of drifting, of getting lost in the woods, is incredibly powerful. And then the idea that there would be these different atmospheres uh, was, it, was also very fascinating. So on the left, you see these stately, old, old beech trees. In the middle, you see a pioneer beech woods. And on the right, you see this completely tormented, apocalyptic woods. And so I began to research, well, why are these all so close together? And of course, the answer is nature itself. And these are huge storms, tornadoes that blew over this site. And on the protected side, um, the tree, beech trees became huge. On the sides where the storm raised the woods, you have this thick, pioneer, um, youthful woods. And on the other sides where the roots were too shallow, the trees are thrown all over the place. And so this project becomes about expressing these three simple places. But to use something where urbanites can go relax, um, to go be in the woods, immerse themselves in the woods, we used the same material as the woods for the paving and the seating. And this is the large, uh, the large stately beech trees. The young um, pioneer forest. And the apocalyptic thrown around forest, which is on a hill. And they're all really just circles of woods where we like to say it's just a place to sit and watch the woods grow. So you're, there is no front, no back. You just sit down, and all of a sudden, you start to see these, uh, these various states of woods and how they grow. The next project right, is a museum of natural history. Um, I was talking about how the Swiss landscapes, the, the paradox of the Swiss landscape and the strangeness of the sites. And the part, I think the sites I'm showing you are becoming increasingly strange. Um, and it's kind of, you only can, can smile or laugh when you're working in, in Switzerland. Maybe you all have similar sites. But this is a museum of natural history, uh, history on a, on a highway tunnel. This is the site before the small park was built, looking over to a famous uh, cathedral, protected cathedral, the back of it, namely. And the strange thing about the site is it's on a highway tunnel. It's surrounded by multifamily housing, sports fields, um, light industry, et cetera, a huge, uh, huge road, loud road. So the question poses itself, how do you talk to an audience about the power of natural history, about letting go and falling into getting lost in this incredibly interesting material while standing in this completely strange artificial site? Um, the first gesture was simply to plant the two edges of the park so that you could cut out this surrounding so that people could immerse themselves into this space. And just to mention again, like the Tony Ariel, the incredible number of constraints we had. The natural uh, historic preservationists came and said, we want the view to the church and the 
highway authorities came and said, you can't plant on these, uh, you know, on the tunnels. And then the director came and said, I don't want any trees in my cafe. And so all these people were cutting away at this little parcel we were trying to create. But basically, we created these two edges. And what we did is use the theory, I say theory, I make up theories, right, of stepping stones. Because stepping stones are something when you go in a garden, it forces you not to walk from A to B, but to tread lightly to tiger, and that's German tiger, through the garden. And you're aware of your steps, you're aware of your body, you're aware of your perception. So blowing that up to a scale of a park, these paving stones are between two and seven meters big, and they become carriers of information about natural history which is strewn around in quite a um, fragmented way. And this is intentional because fragments, we call it catalyst of imagination. These fragments allow you to not be confronted with a pedagogical, uh, pedagogic goal, but to just catch strange expressions, strange words, strange images. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the artificial and the natural as this game in this project, for example. The most famous stone of eastern Switzerland is called Nagelfleur, and it's basically organic concrete. It's identical to concrete. And when you hit concrete, it looks exactly identical to this Nagelfleur, which is a conglomerate. So you have this man-made uh, natural stone, um, which is the famous one. So using these concrete pavers, they become an expression of, for example, the wooden uh, form on the forms on the edge, or slamming them, hammering them to make them expose them as as Nagelfleur, or on the right side you see um, drain mats pressed in, so you have all these ways of bringing the concrete out as an expression of material, but expressing these very many states of what it is between an artificial and natural material. Also putting fossils, uh, it's related to three eras, I'll say in a moment, putting fossils into these so that you are confronted with these strange ruins of history in, the, in this artificial manner. And what you see are the small stones is the most famous natural stone next to Nagelfleur. is a beautiful green sandstone. Um, and whoops, sorry, I'm at the wrong picture. I'm just going to tell something about that in a moment. There are a huge geological words strewn around. Uh, each letter is about 30 centimeters high. So you're confronted with concepts where you think, what on earth could that be? And the answers, of course, are maybe in the museum or not. The entire park is strewn with this natural sandstone so that the entire park can be walked on because next to these big pavers is the idea that you walk in your own sense of moving through the space and discovering, tripping across information. And what you see here as an artifact is actually uh, the main stone for all the architectural um, buildings, uh, the cultural buildings of eastern Switzerland. So it's playing again, again the natural stone with the human man-made result of this stone. And the hydrangea was, uh, we were drawn through the mud in all the press for months because hydrangea is an exotic. We have 70% uh, um, natives, but we put those in explicitly also because of this artificial site. I'm just going to check what I'm doing. Um, we also expressed the three main uh, geological eras of the, of the area because I was always lost in the museums, like 300 billion trillion years old, or was that 200 million years old? So we just took the three main eras and expressed them in a series of different, these are huge, um, huge stones and so on. So I won't go into more detail, but this was our attempt. I'll uh, close with this uh, quote from Darwin. Um, Nothing in life is as constant as change. And we have a series of quotes as well from the Bible, from the church and so on. This next project, there's a new law in Switzerland um, where if a highway goes through a residential area, they're forced to put up a sound barrier wall. This was a competition we were able to win for artists, and we decided to turn the argument around and try and find a poetry in the infrastructure we were asked to make. This is one of the, also a strange site for us, 40 centimeters wide and one kilometer long. We were given the framework from the local authorities. This is the site. And we decided to use etched glass with different degrees of etching so that what the, the sound barrier wall does is collect imagery and abstract it from the entire everyday life of this contemporary urban landscape. And we studied all kinds of effects, what the glass is doing with nature, with uh, artificial light, etc. John Cage has this lovely quote which inspired the project. There's no such thing as an empty space or an empty time. There's always something to see, something to hear. In fact, try as we may to make silence, we cannot. And this silence almost anywhere in the world today is traffic. If you listen to Beethoven, it's always the same. But if you listen to traffic, it's always different. 
So we decided to take this changing landscape and actually collect it into an experience. We studied all kinds of different possibilities. How nature, that's a hill actually, it's a mountain, office lights, autumn color, an office building, a bicyclist, a rainy day. And how all of this imagery can actually be brought to the people juxtaposed in this moving kind of real-time painting of the urban city. This is the Expo project I was mentioning before. Uh, we were able to win this in a team with a writer and architects. We used an entire eastern part of Switzerland as our site. It was an open international competition with 80 entries. We were the only ones who used the entire territory as our topic. And uh, here you see the entire site, so to speak, the, the territory. What we did was a reading of this territory. We broke it into three bands. The ba lake band, the urban landscape band, and the mountain band. And you see a section down at the bottom going from lake to mountain. So we made the landscape actually, first of all, readable as a territory. And then we gave each of these bands a, s a series of attributes. Uh, in the mountains, where do we come from? The history, the archaic, the old, the traditions, etc. In the urban landscape band, who are we? Uh, how do we live? What's our society today? What are we up to? And at the lake, which connects three different nations, Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, where are we going? Which is about future, about longing, about dreaming. And each of these bands uh, received one built element that mankind has used since the beginning of using the landscape and is still continuing today and we transformed it in a new way. So for example, the lake, it's the pier to go fishing, to get a fish to eat, which we made enormous piers and collected all possible boats and rafts and all kind of things there to make this kind of celebration of strange spaces you can make exhibitions in. The crossing using streets in a, in a light industry area for a place for people to meet, to eat, to discuss, etc. And the dance floor, a traditional element of, uh, of Switzerland where small villages used to meet and these villages are dying out and so we made a place to collect. So basically what we did is we said um, all, this would be an expo where all people in the walks of life from politicians, artists, speculators, farmers, everybody who doesn't talk to each other would come together and talk to each other in everything from farmhouses to boats to bunkers to anywhere. And landscape would be the main protagonist, um, the backdrop, and as well the, the, um, the central issue. And what we did then was take 300 trains that move through the landscape and they also become part of the exhibition. And you have a kind of weaving of fictive uh, storytelling, mythological storytelling, and each visitor of the expo would receive their own personal treasure map with their own personal interests and their own personal way of experiencing the landscape and finding others who do that as well. So, I'm sorry, I didn't, I looked, but I didn't, it's okay. Do I have three more minutes or not? Okay, so I will wrap up with the last project. As I said, at least from our perspective, the sites are getting stranger and stranger. Um, this is the last one and this is called A Traumatized Landscape in the Neighborhood. It's an international competition we were able to win in Heidelberg, which is an old Nazi barracks, became NATO headquarters for Europe, and finally uh, American military base, and the task is then to reintegrate it or integrate it for the first time into German society. These are a few images of the site, kind of a, yeah, as you can see, abandoned Nazi site, which is now surrounded by housing, mostly. And what we did, if you can just imagine, this is a, a picture to give you some, some of the sense of uh, there's incredible complexity in this project. Um, but the Burger Park, you see it's an existing park for the elite Nazi um, commissary. Below you see the forum. These are names we gave the places. This is the marching parade place where the big marching power suits powerful things came into culture. That's where the horses used to ride. So these are all places that are about power, control, militarization of, of space. And what we did is to take each of these spaces and connect them through a, a concrete uh, red band, and the red band is actually a recycled ma material. So the main gesture which I want to just tell um, in closing about this is a lot about memory, which we've heard about today. We called it the Park of Encounters, and encounter meaning all kinds of encounters. And the important message for us was uh, Germans cannot really confront their history with humor and we didn't want the history to be lost in this place. We were the only team also from I think 27 who dealt with the history 
And what we said is we'll take all these historical elements, which the Nazis took, this innocent uh, oak trees, which became a Nazi symbol, the innocent eagle, which became a Nazi symbol, the innocent landscape fields, which became transformed. And I'm just going to go through a few points. So all the ways that they took innocent elements and turned them into Nazi symbolism, we're going to take them back, give them back to the German people with a sense of humor, but with a sense of an ability to, to come closer. So for example, the um, land, the agricultural fields became the basis for the Nazi military streets, which were about power and, and showing power. We gave them back to become streets of encounter with a whole series of m ways in which we make them spaces for learning and meeting. The oak tree became um, the main tree of the site. The eagles, which are huge stone eagles there, we took all the surveillance cameras and, and collect them on, on, on a plaza and turn them into bird's nests so that the birds are tweeting and laughing at the Nazi eagles. Uh, we took huge walls which have surrounded the site and turned them into meeting places to sit walls and so on. We took the control booths for, this, for the checkpoints and turned them into playgrounds and um, places of information and, and so on and so forth. So that's what we were doing in transforming this place into a place where people can come together today and have completely in different experience but with a huge attempt not to lose the quality of, of the space. I won't go into details what you're seeing in the imagery but it uh, is a lot about collecting, collecting people, collecting memory, collecting history, uh, collecting artifacts. We are actually collected on hundreds of artifacts and have reused them to create spaces of coming together. Uh, lamps from the 1970s from Americans, all kinds of strange things we've been able to collect and to turn them into new experiences and a new encounter with the history. We've taken the, the pavings of the history, ground them up, and poured them into a new concrete, so the whole concrete becomes sort of shredded history, and when you're walking, you're confronted with this history. And uh, I won't go into anything else. Thank you very much.